Okay, so hi everyone. I think we are already live. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us again for another online meetup of deep learning sessions Lisboa. Uh, as you may already know, uh, I'm just going to uh, remind you of some of our uh, rules and formats. So essentially, we will be doing up to one hour of presentation, and then we will have around 10 to 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, I also ask you that if you have any questions or some comments to do that the speaker may then answer, um, you can do it on the YouTube live chat, uh, which we will then address in the end. Uh, so today we have uh, the honor of having as a speaker, Telmo Pires. He is a machine learning engineer at Apple and a former Google AI residency researcher. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic on to Telmo. Hi, Tom. Hello, everyone. Well, thanks for the introduction, Andre. And well, first of all, thanks for organizing this event and for inviting me. And also a big thank you to all of the audience uh, for taking time off your schedules to be here today. So before uh, I start, uh, let me just uh, have a quick disclaimer. So the opinions you're going to see here are my own not my employers or previous employers and any mistakes are mine and if you see any mistakes please do let me know uh, i'll provide you my email at the end of the talk so um, in this talk uh, i have made uh, four main parts uh, so i'll start by introducing what the language model is i'll then jump on to explain uh, classical language modeling then i'll mention deep learning language modeling and I'll end with uh, applying this in practice to solving the real uh, problem. Uh, I tried to make the talk uh, not overly technical, and uh, I tried to include as many practical examples as I could during the talk. So just before we dive into the topic of uh, our meetup, uh, let me also say a bit about myself. So as Andrea said, my name is Telmo, and I'm currently a machine learning engineer at Apple. Uh, I am in the machine translation team. So some of you might have noticed that in the latest iOS version, uh, there was a new app that translates app, and I'm in the team that's responsible for developing those models. Before Apple, I spent a couple of years in New York um, as a research resident at Google. Uh, I worked in quite a few different projects, uh, but like the two biggest things were multilingual NLP, and uh, depth estimation from images. Before Google, I was at Babel, where I was also a part of the machine translation team. And I had a short stint in the lab's product discovery team. And before that, I was a student at Technico. And during my thesis, I spent my time at Institut Telecomunicações uh, working on trajectory clustering. So without further ado, let's, let's start with our talk. So the first question is, what's a language model? And quite simply, a language model is just a model over that predicts a distribution over sentences. So if I give you a sentence, I am giving a talk, a language model will tell you how likely the sentence is. Um, and the input to this model is then going to be a sequence of tokens uh, from W1 to W1. And these tokens, you can think of them as words and punctuation, basically. And since this is a prob probability distribution, uh, it must sum up to one over all possible uh, sentences. And when I say all possible sentences, I mean really all possible sentences, including completely random ones. And so the reason we're interested in these sorts of models is uh, because we want to, or we think at least that uh, a likely sentence is also a plausible sentence. And so we want to use a language model as a measure of plausibility. So if I give you two sentences, this is a talk, and talk is a this, hopefully a language model will tell you that the first sentence is a lot more likely than the second one. And why do we care about this? So the most obvious uh, application is autocorrect on smartphones. As you probably have noticed, uh, when you're typing on your phone, your keyboard will try to predict the next work 
that you're typing to save you the trouble of having to type it. And this is basically just a language model running for you. But there are other applications. So language models are useful when you're generating text because they help you distinguish between uh, different candidates as a measure of plausibility. And so they've been used in classical speech recognition and phrase phrase machine translation, for example. Also another important application and one that's become more important lately is that of transfer learning. And I'll see more about that later on. So let's dive into classical language modeling. So as I said, we want to model the probability of a sentence. And the most simple idea you can come up with is you download the corpus, say all of Wikipedia, and then you just look at all the sentences and you see that that probability of a sentence is basically how frequently it appears in that corpus. So the probability of the sentence W1 to W1 is the number of times you've seen that sentence divided by the total number of sentences. However, there's a problem with this approach. And the problem is that the space of possible sentences is huge. So that means that no matter how big your cor corpus is, there will be lots of sentences that you've never seen at training time. And according to this model, since you've not seen them, the count is zero and the probability is zero. So this clearly isn't a very good language model. To uh, overcome these problems, uh, people then developed what are called n-gram language models. And the idea behind n-gram language models is the following. So applying the chain rules of probabilities, you can decompose the probability of a full sentence as the product of uh, the probability of a given word conditioned on the words before it. So for this example here, uh, this probability would be the probability of the first word times the probability of word two conditioned on word one times the probability of word three conditioned on words one and two, and so on. But you'll notice that this means that our model needs to handle an unbounded context. And that's slightly trickier and we'll leave that for later. So for now, we'll make an assumption. And that assumption is that the i-th word depends only on a few words before it. And that's why we call these models the n-gram models. For an n-gram model, the model depends only on the n minus one words before it. So the most simple n-gram model is a unigram language model. And in this case, you just assume that words don't depend on the context. So the probability of the word i is independent of any of the previous words. And you can just compute it by counting the number of times you see the word i divided by the sum of all counts of all words in your corpus. But of course, like this model is really too simple. And you can get more advanced and say use a bigram language model, where you say that the probability of word i depends only on the word immediately before it. And so this can be computed then as the number of times you've seen the word uh, i following word i minus one divided by the number of times you've seen word i minus one. And you can keep doing this on and on, and then you can go to trigram language models where you say that word i depends only on the words i minus one and i minus two, and you'll get similar formulas. Another uh, use for this is that you can then take a language model and use it to generate text following a style. And we can very simply do that using NLTK, a Python library for natural language processing. So here in this example I'm showing you, I am importing NLTK and I'm downloading a corpus called inaugural, which consists of, speaks, uh, of inaugural speeches of uh, US presidents. So you import an LTK, you download uh, that corpus. Then I just wrote a very simple function that takes as input the bigram probabilities, um, the start word, the word you want to start the sentence with, and how many words you want the sentence to have. And then to generate text, it's really simple. You just take the last word you've seen. So in the beginning, this is just the start word. And you go to your probability table and you just predict the most likely word to follow the word that you have. Then you append that, and in the end, you just concatenate the full list and return it. To compute the probability table, you just get all of the words in the corpus, 
then uh, you apply the nltk.bygrams function that, as the name indicates, just returns all the possible bygrams. And finally, uh, you uh, use nltk.conditional frequency distribution, uh, and that will give you, will compute the probability table for the bygrams. Then to generate text, you just call the function and pass it the probability table and uh, a start word. And this model will be able to generate text following the style of the inaugural corpus. So looking at these two sentences, you can clearly see a problem. And the fact is that the model starts repeating itself very quickly. And the reason this happens is because if you look at the code I wrote, uh, I pick the most likely word uh, at each step. And so that means that when I pick a very common word, the model will very likely enter into a loop quickly. Uh, one way to avoid this would, of course, be to um, sample instead of uh, taking the most likely word. But since I'm just using a bigram model, the sentences we're generating wouldn't be very good. And if you wanted uh, better results, you probably have to put trigrams and foregrams to generate something that actually looks that reasonable English. But let's now mention uh, a way to use this in practice. So before I mentioned that one application is was in a phrase-based machine translation. So in machine translation, uh, you basically have this optimization problem. So you have a Portuguese sentence with words from F1 to FM, and you want to find the English sentence that is most likely the translation of a Portuguese sentence. We can apply the Weiss rule to this formula and we'll get the following. So the probability of the English sentence given the Portuguese sentence is the product of the, uh, of the probability of the Portuguese sentence given the English sentence. That is, this is a language mo uh, a translation model but in the reverse direction times an English language model divided by a constant. Uh, this constant in the denominator is just the probability of the Portuguese sentence, but since it's fixed, uh, it doesn't affect our optimization problem and we can safely ignore it. And you might be thinking now, but how did this help us? Uh, because initially I wanted a model to translate from Portuguese to English, but now we have a dependency on a model that translates from English to Portuguese. And the answer is that this helps us because now we also have a dependency on a language model. And the language model, as I said before, acts as a measure of how plausible a sentence is. So if we know how plausible a given English sentence is, we can get away with a weaker uh, English to Portuguese model and come up with a better translation. Let me explain you how. So uh, the way a phrase-based machine translation worked was as follows. So it had a phrase table, hence the name, and in this table, it has common translations uh, of uh, different phrases and words, along with the corresponding probabilities. So then the system would just generate plausible candidates, and you'd use the language model to pick the most likely one, or the one that seems like the best English sentence. So say we want to translate the word, uh, the sentence I mean, de uh, to English. So, uh, candidate that this model would come up with is the following. So it would look at the table and say, well, the word off is translated as the 99% of the time. And the word nothing is translated as another 99% of the time. So by combining these two, I say that the probability of off nothing being translated as the nothing is roughly 98%. Fortunately, because this translation is obviously bad, we then have the language model part. And the language model will tell us that of nothing is not really a common English sentence and will give it a very low probability. And so when we multiply the two, we'll get a low value. Another candidate that our uh, machine translation system will hopefully come up with is you are welcome. So it will look at the table and say, well, 90% of the time I've seen the phrase you are welcome it was translated as the nada. And the English uh, language model will tell it that, well, this is actually a plausible sentence. It's at least more plausible than the previous alternative. So when you multiply the two, 
And even though we now get, uh, we have the, the probability of our translation model is only 90% compared to the 98% we had before, when we multiply these two probabilities, we get a larger value than for the other candidate translation. And so the language model, model helped steer us to a better translation, which we could have not done just using the other translation model. And you can imagine applying this technique to other scenarios, like speech recognition, where you might have sentences that sound really similar, but are completely different. And it might be tricky to distinguish them uh, just by looking at the phonemes, such as the following two sentences, recognize speech and recognize speech. As you might have noticed now, the sentences sound really alike, and the model just looking at the phonemes would have trouble distinguishing between the two of them. Uh, but by using a language model, you can tell that one of them is more likely than the other. And so you can come up with a better candidate. And this mostly covers what I wanted to mention about classical language models, but I can't jump to uh, deep learning language models without mentioning some problems with the approaches uh, I've shown before. So the first problem is that as you increase the size of n-gram language models, they become harder to train. And the reason is data sparsity. Say you're training a four-gram language model. Even if you have a really big corpus, uh, the number of possible four-grams is really large. So there's a big likelihood that well, there will be a four-gram that you've never seen at training time. And since you've never seen it, since we compute the probabilities by the ratios of counts, the probability of that foreground will be zero. And uh, since the probability of a sentence is just the product of the probabilities of the foregrams, then the probability of those sentence will be zero, which makes them all clearly fail. People working on this, uh, of course, develop some solutions. Uh, one of them is smoothing, which basically means that you always assign a small probability to any, to every foreground, no matter uh, if you've never seen it before. And so the probability will never actually be zero. Another alternative is to use interpolation. And this means that you, besides your foregram model, you train a trigram model, a bigram model, and a unigram model. And you interpolate between the three of them. And so you can think of this as a sort of um, like fallback. So when your foregram model doesn't have a foregram, maybe the trigram or the bigram has it. Another problem is the lack of semantics. So the models I've showed before, they don't really have any knowledge about the similarity between words. So they can't really transfer the knowledge between distinct words. So that I have two sentences, uh, I like dogs and I like puppies. Uh, so we know that dogs and puppies are really similar. So the probability of the two sentences should be more or less similar. But one of these language models can't handle that because it doesn't know that dogs and puppies are similar. And that's something we'll tackle now in the deep learning land. So just to start, I'm going to make an aside to talk about word embeddings uh, because word embeddings are a way to solve the problem of uh, semantics. So the idea behind word embeddings is that you represent each word as a vector in a high-dimensional space. And what we want is to have similar words uh, be represented by similar vectors. So for the example I gave before, the word for dogs and for puppies would be similar uh, in this high-dimensional space. And people have, uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, word embeddings and people have done all sorts of curious things, one of which I show on the slide. So here you have uh, a, a representation of high dimensional space, of course, uh, with four embeddings, man, king, woman, and queen. And what people have observed by playing uh, with word embeddings is that if you take the vector pointing from man to woman and the vector pointing from queen to uh, king to queen, they are pretty similar. So you can do sort of word math. So if you, if you take the vector for king, and add the vector pointing from uh, man to woman, you'll get the vector that's pretty similar to the embedding for queen. And so this will allow us to uh, handle uh, the semantics and the language, the word similarity. But you might be wondering how we train these embeddings. 
the basic idea behind training important patterns is to uh, predict the worth given the context around it. So take this sentence, the quick brown fox jumps, and take uh, the middle worth. So the context for the middle worth, brown, is the quick fox jumps. So we take uh, the embeddings for the words the quick fox and jumps, and we add them together. And in the beginning, since we don't have embeddings yet, we'll just initialize them with random values. Then we add these vectors together and we multiply them by the embedding matrix where each row is an embedding. So say the first row is the embedding for apple, the second row the embedding for B and so on. And you have as many rows as there are words in your vocabulary. And uh, so you multiply by this matrix and you add a bias vector, which is there to account for the fact that some words are much more likely than others. So when you do this operation, you'll get a vector with as many entries as words in your vocabulary. So we then apply the softmax function and we get the probability distribution over words. And then we just train this model to maximize the probability of the missing word, which in this case is the word brown. And by the way, I here used addition. So I added uh, all the words in the context, but you can use any other function. Uh, I'll shortly talk about uh, more advanced models, such as CNNs, RNNs, and transformers. And you can, could use them instead of uh, this simple addition I'm doing here. So let's go back to language models. So if you remember, um, we wanted to model the conditional probability distribution of word i given uh, words uh, um, one to i minus one, that is the words before uh, the word i. And um, just to avoid the problem of uh, varying context, let's make the same simplifying assumption and just clip the context. So let's still do an n-gram language model. But let's do it using the word embeddings, using something called convolutional neural networks. So here we have the same sentence that we've seen before, the quick pound fox jumps. And uh, you might notice that I have uh, two special words in the beginning. Uh, those are just a special start symbol, because in the beginning, when you're trying to predict the first word, you need to tell the model that there are no words before it. And that's what the start symbol is for. So uh, the convolutional neural network first looks at um, the first two symbols, which in this case are just the start symbol, and predicts the first word in the sentence, the. After knowing the word the, it takes the uh, other start symbol, the word the, and predicts quick. Then with the, quick, predicts brown, and so on, until the end of the sentence. And uh, this is basically a trigram language model because it only uses the context of two words before uh, the current word. Uh, but compared to the models I showed you before, it has the advantage that now, since it's using uh, word embeddings, it has a concept of semantics and knows how to generalize between similar words. But if we're not using the context, uh, we're leaving information on the table, right? We can. If we can use the full context, we can probably come up with better language models. And so to do that, people develop what are called recurrent neural networks. And the idea behind recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, is to use recursivity. So again, here we have the probability distribution we want to model. And we'd say that it's a function of two variables. The first variable is the current word. And uh, the second variable is the context. And this context is just a function applied to the previous word. And if you keep doing this recursively back to the beginning of the sentence, then you have a representation of the full sentence of a varying context. So let's see how our NANs work step by step. Uh, I know that in this meetup, uh, there was already a presentation about our NANs, so I'm not going to get about many details, but just going to give a general overview of how they work. So we start again with the special start symbol and uh, our RNN. And initially, since we have no context, we just feed it zeros. And we train this to predict the first word in the sentence, the. Then once you know the word the, we feed that to the model along with the context from before. 
from the previous state uh, of the RNN and train it to predict quick. And now we keep doing this and we train the model to predict the full sentence. Behind RNNs, there are other models that allow you to deal with unlimited context. And one such model is the transformer model. Uh, the way the transformer model works is that it directly attends to all of the previous words. And it's able to do this by using something called an attention mechanism. I'm not going to get into many details about uh, how an attention mechanism works or how transformers work, uh, because there was already another meetup by Pedro Freire that uh, described that. But the general idea is the following. So initially, we just have the start symbol. And so we feed that to the transformer model and we train it to predict the word the. Then we have two words, the start symbol and the word the. So the model looks at both of them and predicts the word quick. Now we have three words. So we look at the three of them and predict the next word. And we keep doing this always attending at all the words that we've seen so far until we reach the end of the sentence. And what I've just described is pretty much all a model called GPT works. So you probably have heard about GPT. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Training, and it's a model developed by OpenAI. And there are already three versions of it. And this model has generated quite a lot of attention because uh, so it's a big transformer model trained on lots of data. And uh, it's able to generate pretty realistic text. And also, it learns a lot of fascinating information in its representations. Let me show you an example. So I took this example from OpenAI's blog post about GPT-2, where they do the following. So they take uh, this sentence uh, about an incident with nuclear materials in Cincinnati, and they give it to the model. And then they ask the model to predict the next word. And once they have that next word, they add it to the text and ask the model to predict the one after. And they keep doing this until they've generated the text. And the great thing about GPT is that it generates really coherent text. So here you have the text that it generated, which I'm not going to read that right now. But if you look at the text, you'll see that first, it follows like the news style. So it seems like a news article. Then it uh, makes use of several information. It talks about the US Department of Energy and the US Energy Secretary. You'll also see that the, at least at the sentence level, uh, the sentences are themselves very coherent, which is not something that you could get using like Enneagram language models. Although there are still some consistency problems like in the long term. So if you look at text generated by these systems, uh, you'll probably notice that long-term dependencies, which are harder to learn, are not properly learned by the model. And so the model might start talking about something and then later in the text, start changing topic or contradicting itself. But as I said, uh, GPT has these big representations and besides generating plausible text, it also learns common knowledge. So you can play with GPT, there are many websites that you do this, or you can uh, write, import it from Python. So you just need to download uh, this package from a interface called Transformers, then import GPT to Excel, and then you give it some text and ask it to complete it. And here I gave it the prompt, uh, Paris is the capital of, and the model successfully predicted uh, friends and started giving me some information about uh, Paris, talking about the French cuisine, and also giving a number of inhabitants. I don't think the number of inhabitants is actually correct. I think the real number is between 10 and 12 million, depending on how you, how you define Paris. But you can see that the model clearly has some information and some knowledge about what Paris is. That said, like this model is not trained to uh, learn knowledge. It's, just, it's a language model trained to, generate, trained to generate plausible text. And when I gave it the sentence, Lisbon is the capital of, it correctly predicted Portugal, but then it started spewing out nonsense, saying that Portugal is in the northwestern part of Europe, and um, Lisbon is one of the three capitals of Portugal, the other two being Porto and Porto León. 
I should make a disclaimer though, because this is not the real uh, GPT-2 model, but the model provided by Eigenface. So some of the issues we're looking at are probably because uh, the model is not as good. Recently, a few months ago, you might have heard the news and heard that uh, OpenAI announced GPT-3, which is a much bigger uh, language model and so big that it's not even comparable to all of the language models we had before. So here I show you a tiny plot where you can see, oh, I'm being told that you can see the slides. Uh, let me change that then. Can you see the slides now? Okay, let me go back a little bit. I hope you've seen this part. Uh, just in case you haven't, you might just uh, mention some of uh, a bit of it again. So I, I was saying that uh, the model learns some knowledge, but it's, since it's trained just to generate plausible text, it doesn't really care about what's true. And like it can just say words that like, they are valid English text, but they're totally false, such as the one about Lisbon being one of the three capitals of Portugal. So um, I was saying that GPT, uh, OpenAI announced uh, GPT-3, which is a much bigger version of uh, the GPT language model trained on uh, a lot more text. And here I show you a plot where you can see um, the language model size over time. And the latest point on this plot is GPT-3, which was trained with 175 billion parameters. And this is like a huge engineering feat. It's incredible that they were able to train a model this big. And it's such a complex feat that the previous biggest model uh, oops, was uh, an order of magnitude smaller with 17 billion parameters. And this model trained on a lot more text and with a much bigger representation uh, learns all sorts of things. So there are many blog posts uh, of people that have played with GPT-3 um, you need to sign up. There's like a wait line, as far as I know. Um, and you sign up, you get access, and people have been playing with it. And there's this blog post that I link here on the slide where they give uh, GPT-3 a Turing test. So they ask it some common questions. So they start with, what's your favorite animal and why? And you see that the model is able to provide like plausible answers. So it says that it likes dogs because they're loyal and friendly. And you can even ask it about code. Uh, so they then went on to some programming questions. They asked it to write some Ruby code and it did somewhat decent job. And like, this is impressive. It's like really surprising that the model can learn this. But this is something that people talk about on the web. So the model has seen examples of people talking about how to write code and talking about what their favorite animals are. But what happens if you ask this model just like some nonsensical questions, like how many eyes does my food have? And the model can't really distinguish because it's trained to predict reasonable text. So what it has seen online is that when someone asks how many eyes does something have, the answer is your something has something eyes. And so that's the prediction it makes. So if you ask it how many eyes your food has, it will mention in this case two or some other number. But the answer doesn't really make sense because the model doesn't really care about the knowledge. Like it's not trained to have like a knowledge representation. So you can even ask it like weirder things like how many rainbows does it take to jump from a Y to 17? And the model will give you an answer. It's just nonsense, but it will give you like a grammatical English sentence. And there are plenty of other things you can do with GPT. Um, there's uh, a game that I mentioned uh, in, at the end of the slides called AI Dungeon. And um, that's basically one of those uh, text-based games where you write uh, the action you want to take, say, go outside, uh, pick up stone. But you're doing this to a language model. So the story is not written before it. And that it's generated for you on the spot. And it can, it can be really interesting. So if you have the time, I really think you should go and uh, try it out. 
So GPT is very interesting, uh, and I could give a full talk about GPT, but nowadays, one of the most important things, uh, or one of the most important reasons people care about language models is for transfer learning. So a problem that we have in machine learning is that label data is expensive because label data is created by humans. So you need humans to uh, write or to annotate text for you. And that besides being expensive is also very slow. But if we're training a model to do some NLP task, we have so much text online. Can't we just use that text to learn something like generic about English? To learn what's a good English sentence and then use our small amount of uh, label data to come up with a good model using that good representation of English. That's the idea behind transfer learning. And you've already seen an example of transfer learning through word embeddings. And um, one of the new ideas around the block was to use uh, language models to come up with better word embeddings. So before we move on to that, let me just ask you a question. What is a bank? So probably the first thing most of you thought of was a money institution, uh, the kind of institution where you go to to ask for money. Or if you've lived in the Western society for the past 10 years, this institution that comes to your government to ask for money. But there's also an alternative use for the word bank which is the banks of the river, that is the terrains on each side of the river. And if I say the sentence, I took a bath in the river and then I sat on the bank, you don't think that I sat on Goldman Sachs, you probably think that I sat on the bank of the river. Why? Because the context leads you that way. And so the thing that allows us to distinguish between the meaning of words is their context. And word embeddings, as uh, I've showed them so far, they don't take context into account. So the context for the word bank uh, explain, uh, needs to explain the both meanings for the word bank, the word money institution and the river bank. But then people came up with something called contextualized embeddings, that is embeddings that change depending on the words around it. One of the first attempts to do that was a model called ELMO. So ELMO stands for embeddings from language models and the basic idea is that you take the even states of an RNN and use them as embeddings. So then if you want to use this in practice, you have like your original word embeddings, you feed them to Elmo and you get these contextualized embeddings where now each embedding depends on the words around it. So if you are the word bank here in this sentence, uh, the word embedding for bank would change depending on the meaning that it has in that sentence. So then you just feed these representations to a model as before a neural network and you train a model just as you, you did with normal word embeddings. And that model now should perform much better because these embeddings know their context and are much better representations than the previous ones which didn't have context. So ALMO is actually surprisingly simple as a model. It's just two language models uh, functioning at the same time, but in two different directions. So we're gonna have a language model that's going from left to right, and the model that's going from right to left. So here you have the same sentence uh, as before, the quick brown fox jumps, and I just added two special symbols that start in the end to signal the boundaries of the sentence. So then you feed the start symbol to an RNN and train it to predict the word the. And you do the same for the other RNN that's going to see the sentence in the reverse order. So it gets the word end and is trained to predict chops. And then at each time step, each of these RNNs is going in opposite directions uh, to predict the next word. So this is exactly the same one that I showed before. These are two language models, but they're trained on two different directions. But how do we use this then to get uh, the contextualized embeddings? That's simple. So for each word, you take the even representation for the RNN, for the two RNNs, and you concatenate them. And you use that as the contextualized embedding. And this thing worked so well 
So that after that, many people worked on coming up with better contextualized embeddings. And one such approach was BERT, uh, a model developed by Google. And BERT stands for uh, bi uh, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, if I'm not mistaken. And the way BERT works is slightly different. So here we have the same sentence as before with two differences. Uh, so I took out the word quick and replaced it by this special word called mask that just tells the model that there was a word here that I hit. And I replaced the word fox by a random word from our vocabulary. So then we just ran a transformer on this sentence. But now this is a transformer that actually looks at the full sentence because when we're computing these contextualized embeddings, we have access to the full sentence, so we don't need to limit ourselves to the words that came before. And so for each uh, token, we compute a representation that takes into account all of the other words. And we just repeat these over many layers. And at the end, we train this model to predict the missing words. So in this case, quick and fox. So this is slightly different than what I'm showed before, because this is not a real language model. Uh, a real language model predicts uh, a word given its context and can be used to predict the probability of a sentence, uh, which is not the case for BERT. So you cannot use BERT to generate text, but you can use it to generate uh, these representations. And the thing is that these representations are really, really good. So to apply BERT, you take your original tokens, you feed them to BERT, and you get these contextualized embeddings. Then you feed that to a neural network, and you get state-of-the-art results. So of course, this is not true. Like You're not going to always get state-of-the-art results. But for many tasks and for a period of time after BERT came out, a surprising number of NLP papers were people saying, I applied BERT to my problem, and now it works really well. And this thing is, works so well that Google is now using this in production for search. And uh, many other people have tried to improve the word representations so we have had papers like Albert and Robert. So how do we actually use this in practice? So let's say that we uh, want to develop a part of speech tagging system. So a part of speech tagging system is just a system that predicts the grammatical category for each word. And this is useful for many downstream tasks. Say that you want to write a parser or an entity recognition system or a chatbot. You'll likely want to have a part of speech tags. So for the sentence I show you on the slide, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, a part of speech tagging system should predict their corresponding part of speech tags, which in this case are that the is the determiner, quick and brown are adjectives, fox is a noun, jumps is a verb, and so on. So if you want to use BERT to develop a uh, part of speech tagging system, we take our tokens, we feed them to BERT, we get our contextualized representation, and now we pass that to a neural network. And since this contextualized representation is already so good, our neural network can be really simple, like just a single layer that predicts the tags. So this works really well, and uh, for many tasks, like if you look at the BERT paper, you'll see that this approach gives you state-of-the-art results. But you might be thinking, but why would I want to use BERT, which is such a big model, for a task? Because like my previous techniques already gave me some good results, so why would I want to expend more resources to run BERT? That's a fair question, and I'll try to motivate that by looking at um, multilingual NLP. So let's say that I now tell you that I want a multilingual part of speech tagging system. So we need to support multiple languages. I think that's easy. I'll just add more models. So I'll train an English part of speech tagging model, a Portuguese part of speech tagging model, a Spanish one, a German one, and so on. And then when I get a sentence from our user, we just pipe that to a system that identifies the language, which you call language ID. And that system just figures out the language, in this case Portuguese, fits that to the appropriate model, and we get our part of speech tags. However, this approach has two problems. 
The first problem is that this requires a lot of models. Um, if you want to support 30 languages, you need 30 models, and that's a lot of maintenance work to uh, develop and maintain all those models. But also, this approach is a bit brittle in the way that it fails in the presence of code mixed text. So code mixing is what happens when people mix different languages in the same sentence, as I'm showing here in this example, where people mixed uh, English and Hindi. And uh, this is surprisingly common um, in countries like India, where people mix English and Hindi, or in countries uh, in Latin America, where people mix English and Spanish. And you yourselves might have done this when you're talking Portuguese and you include some uh, English words in the text. And the problem with uh, these uh, sentences is that the language identification model fails. Because how should you tag this sentence? It's not English, but it's also not Hindi. It's somewhere in between. So you might think, uh, okay, so I, I'll just develop another model that handles English and Hindi part of speech. And you could do that, but that doesn't really scale well because this can happen for many languages. So you need a lot more models, but also it's really hard to come up with annotated uh, code mix data. So you need to do that yourself. And that's quite a big, uh, big cost. So what we'd want to have ideally was uh, a model that could handle all of the languages. So if we could get rid of language identification part, and not just a model that could uh, work in any language and any mix of languages. That would solve this problem. But can we do that? The answer is sort of. Uh, there have been some approaches that have done this with some success. And what we want to have, or the general idea behind it, is we want to have a multilingual representation for text. So if you have a multilingual representation, uh, when the model, uh, we, you can train the model on, say, English text. And then if you feed it Portuguese text, since it has a representation that's multilingual and then similar, the model can transfer what it learned from English to the Portuguese. And uh, one of the approaches to do this was a variant of BERT called multilingual BERT. And multilingual BERT actually is a quite simple approach. So what they do in multilingual BERT model is they take the Wikipedias from over a hundred languages and concatenate to them together and train BERT on that. So that they don't tell the model anything about uh, what, they don't give them a dictionary between the different languages. They don't give any the model any clue about language. They just feed it this concatenated text of all the Wikipedias. The only special thing they do is they use the shared word piece vocabulary across all the languages. So a word piece vocabulary means that instead of you predicting full words, you break the words into chunks, and uh, instead of mocking them the full words, you just model these chunks or these pieces. For example, if you are the word education, you could split it in these two parts. And if you have the corresponding word in Portuguese, educa sound, you could split it in educa and sound. And now you might notice that that chunk, that piece, is shared for the two languages. And we believe this is important for the following reason. If you train two independent models, for one for English and one for Portuguese, they'll end up with uh, incompatible representations. So what the model learns about English can be transferred to the Portuguese because the representations are in different subspaces. However, if you have uh, uh, these shared word pieces that are the same across uh, two different languages, that means that those word pieces need to be the same because they are shared. So I represent that here by those uh, dots. And since they have to be the same, you can, you can imagine that you basically have something that's pushing these two subspaces together. And hopefully you can get that in the end, uh, these two subspaces aligned. So you'd have then an English and a Portuguese representation that's more or less transferable. And that's more or less what we think is happening uh, in the model I described. So here I show you uh, a graph from a work that analyzes uh, multilingual BERT and compares it with the uh, English version of BERT. So on this plot, I have on the x-axis the overlap between two languages. And the overlap is uh, just measured by the fraction of common word pieces between two languages. 
On the y-axis, I have uh, a zero-shot score. So zero is bad, 100 is perfect. And each point is a model that was trained on one language and evaluated on a different language. So that's why we call it zero-shot, zero-shot transfer. So the crosses here represent multilingual word. And for multilingual word, you can see a clear trend. Uh, the more similar two languages are, the better you can transfer knowledge between them. And if you have two languages that are dissimilar, the performance will be quite low. When you use the multilingual word representations on the other end, you'll notice that the performance is more or less independent of the overlap between languages. That is, the model is able to transfer even between languages that are not that similar, meaning that we have, or the model has, some multilingual representation underneath. And even in the part uh, of the plot where the trend is not uh, flat, you can still see that it's still much better than the alternative model. However, these models, uh, these uh, representations have still some problems. Um, the work that I linked on the previous slide talks about that to a further length. But one of the problems is that the model finds it hard to generalize between languages that use very different word orders. But that's not really that surprising, right? Because to this model, we just gave it uh, text. We didn't tell it anything about language. We didn't give it uh, parallel dictionaries. We didn't use parallel text. So in theory, if we can give that to the model, we can uh, make the representations better. And that's what a group from Facebook did. Um, they wrote this paper called XLM, where they use the following approach. So they take parallel text where they have the same sentence in two different languages. So here you can see the same sentence both in English and in French. And they apply the same trick that I showed you before for words. So they randomly mask some words. And now they ask the model to predict them. The thing is now when you're predicting, say, the word curtains, you can look at the, the context in English, but also at the corresponding word in French. So you can learn that uh, the French word rideau, not sure if I'm reading this properly, means curtains. And so this hopefully will make the model learn better multilingual representations. So let's go back to our uh, part of speech system. So before we had this pipeline with multiple models and a language identification step, that was very brittle. So if I gave it the sentence, adjust the learning rate, where I have some mixing here between Portuguese and English, the model would be confused because language ID will be able to give this to a right model because there isn't the right model. So we can now get rid of that. And if we replace that by a multilingual model, we can have a model that works for mixes of languages and for any language. And so we now have less maintenance work and we have better results. So we have the best of both worlds. So I hope that this uh, is enough of a justification of reason to look into uh, why you should uh, maybe consider using these bigger uh, models and these more advanced multilingual representations. So that kind of summarizes uh, all I have to say for today. Um, so just to mention the highlights of this presentation, um, I gave you a quick introduction to language modeling and I showed you why and how it is useful. So both directly uh, to say autocorrect or to generate plausible text or indirectly useful to learn uh, these uh, representations for transfer learning. Also, they're fun. So I've showed you the examples uh, using GPT. And if you search online, you'll see people trying to use GPT for all sorts of things. So I mentioned that game, AI Dungeon. Check it out. It's really cool. And that's basically the end of it. You have my email on the slide. So if you saw any mistakes or if you had any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, you also have my LinkedIn there, although I must warn you that I don't really check LinkedIn that often. So without further ado, I'm now open to any questions that you might have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom, for the awesome uh, presentation. So like I said in the beginning, we have a few minutes for the Q&A. Uh, if anyone wants to ask more questions, we have some time now. So let's start with a question from Inish. Uh, so she asked, 
on the autocorrect example, if we want to predict possibly more than one word at once, is there a measure that gives the probability of the next words normalized by the number of words? Sorry, can you, can you say that again? So essentially, if we want to predict possibly more than one word at once, mm -hmm. is there a way to that gives the probability of the next words normalized by the number of words? So more than one word, essentially. Uh, so you need to change these models. So there are some works that try to do that. There's a work from Google uh, that tries to do that for translation. Uh, because so a bottleneck that you have when you're doing machine translation is that you have to generate the words one step at a time. And that basically slows you down. That sequential nature of translation slows you down. And um, if you could come up with a system that predicts multiple words at a time, you could cut that time short. And some people have tried to do that, but you need to do some changes to the model so that instead of you predicting just one word, it predicts given only the words you've testing so far, uh, like three or four words ahead. But mm -hmm. without doing extra changes, the only thing you can do is like try all the combinations and that's like exponential. Yeah, makes sense. And regarding uh, this final part of the multilingual models, uh, so we had this first approach of using chunks of the words. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you go about deciding the length of these chunks? Okay, so I didn't mention that, but these, we don't select these chunks um, manually. Uh, you have uh, some approaches that find the chunks for you. So the way that you work on a high level is the following. So you basically initially start with all the characters. And then when you see uh, two characters occurring frequently, say uh, DH for the word the, you group those two characters together. And that becomes then a word in your vocabulary. But then you see that the word the occurs frequently so you group th and the word and the letter e so you now have the word the and you keep doing this and you what you have to specify is how many operations you want to keep doing and uh, so the model will or this method will learn by itself what pieces to use not sure if this was clear enough yeah i, I still have to check uh, how it really decides these these combinations but it's an uh, interesting so approach it's bpe if you're interested BPE? uh bpe mm -hmm. uh, so or if you search for subword units you, you'll find some results but the basic idea is that yes so you just start grouping uh the most common words basically the idea is that you want your um, encoding to be um, as small as possible. So if you have a word that's frequent, you want to have that word as an embedding, but if the word is not very frequent, you'll divide it into multiple chunks. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we talked a lot about these uh, large language models that are appearing right now. And uh, I have this curiosity if you think that using essentially few shot or even zero shot learning from these large language models, if these uh, techniques could replace more task-specific, fine-tuned models? So um, ideally, you always want to have, to have some data. So uh, the, the, the work I mentioned about, about uh, multilingual work, something I worked on. And um, so you can train, uh, a, say, entity recognition or a part of speech model for English, for example, using multilingual work and then you evaluate it on a different language. And it will work and it will be surprisingly good, uh, but you can still make the model better if you have it. So if you don't have anything, okay, sure. Like if you really need to use a model and you don't have any data, sure, you can try that. But it's always a good idea to try to gather even if a small quantity of data to, because it allows you to come up with a much better model. Because if the model is already somewhat good without having seen any data, by seeing a small amount becomes better. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's always interesting to see that, uh, yeah, with these examples that are appearing of GPT three, for instance, since it trained on a whole lot of different language and even, for instance, coding uh, examples, uh, you see that it already can do some other tasks uh, that are seem to be outside of language, right? So, yeah, but that's true. Um, and uh, people have been doing that. They have asked GPT to do some of those, uh, some LP tasks, and it can do them to some success. Uh, I think GPT-3 can do even the translation that it just learned by looking at text on the web. Uh, that said, like there's nothing, say that you want like a, to do part of speech. 
and if you ask GPT to do part of speech, it might give you some part of speech tags, but there's nothing really forcing the model only to predict part of speech tags. So all the models I showed you so far, they can only predict a part of speech tag for a word. So they cannot give you like a random word instead of a part of speech tag. While GPT can do that. So you can have a system that when it gets some input, instead of saying that, well, this word's a verb, it can say this word is a banana. Hmm. And uh, like, you need to deal with those cases, basically. But yeah. it's a promising research direction. It's certainly promising. Yeah. Uh, we also have this question from Gerardo. So he asks, can you use word embeddings to predict any kind of language? I mean, not human language, but say DNA, RNA, RNA sequences, digital codes, et cetera. Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, and people have done that. Um, there's word on people, uh, on, there's work on people doing um, word embeddings for DNA. Uh, I believe there was even a group working on a BERT version uh, for um, proteins. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, uh, NLP and uh, genes are, are quite similar. Like you have a different vocabulary, but the ideas are the same. And I know many people that started working in NLP and then switched to computational genetics. So that's a great question. There is some work on doing that. I can't mention any out of the top of my head, but if you shoot me any, an email, I might be able to point you to some things. Interesting. Uh, and so there's also this, this interesting question that arises from the plot that you showed before. Uh, about the growing size of parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think this means of this growing size of the models to smaller research teams or, or business teams uh, if they still can have some value in this field? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, people have been wondering themselves at that. Um, and it's true that like not everyone could have made uh, GPT-3 or even like smaller models like BERT because you don't, have just the cost of training the model. Like you have all the costs for research and development because the first few attempts are not going to work well and they still cost you money. Uh, and I, th I think there was an estimate that the um, first BERT model costed like $500 to train on Google Cloud. Um, I mean, of course, like a smaller research group can't do that. The good thing is that the big research groups that are doing this, they are aware of that. And so what they're doing is they release uh, the model checkpoints. And sure, it might, it might be really expensive for you to train uh, BERT, but you can use it uh, for your problems at a much lower cost. Yeah, so uh, essentially using the pre-trained models is what yeah, exactly. you're doing. It does not mean that there are not some research directions that are limited, right? Because again, I, I can't imagine like anyone say a technique developing a model like GPT-3 because they just don't have the resources. Right. Yeah, it's it's a tricky world right now, but uh, yeah, we can still at least rely on these pre-trained models. Um, we have this question also from Ivo Pinheiro. So he asks, uh, if uh, I use a pre-trained model like GPT-2 or 3, can I add a new very niche conversation specific to a problem and use a weighting of say 80% on GPT and 20% on our own training data. Yes, uh, people have done that. Um, that's a common thing. It's also a form of transfer learning. Uh, for example, it's very common in computer vision. Say you have, uh, you take a ResNet that's trained to predict the category in, of an image. And now you want to apply that to a slightly different domain, say to distinguish between different kinds of trees. So you just add your own data and uh, you use the representations that the model already learned that are very useful and good. And using your small amount of data, you can uh, get a better model, at least better than the model you'd get by just training on your data. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, all right, so without further questions of the, the audience, uh, I'd just like to ask a final, almost uh, philosophical question. <laughs> What do you think the, that these new uh, larger language models represents in the path towards uh, general artificial intelligence? Hmm. Okay, that's that's a tricky question. Um, so, as I mentioned during the presentation, like all of these models can do like some really amazing things, 
like, it's not like a model really knows what it's saying. And the examples asking uh, those nonsense questions clearly prove it. So the model is, it, it learned something, like it has some knowledge deep within, uh, but the model is just trained to generate plausible text. So it doesn't really know what it's saying. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried about some of the applications for these models, right? Um, people have been concerned, even OpenAI has been concerned that people might use GPT to generate fake news, for example. And that's certainly something that we need to think about. But in terms of uh, like creating a general intelligence, uh, I think, I mean, I think this is cool research and it's important, but I don't think it's really getting us closer to understanding the meaning of language. It has its practical usefulness, but we, we still don't know what it means to understand language, right? And that's right. something that we don't really know how to model. We know how to apply some things to solve problems we care about, but we don't really know what it means to understand. Right. So if we can't even define intelligence and the comprehension of language, it gets a bit difficult, right? Yeah, true, exactly. So we probably need to answer those first because uh, so I think there's this quote saying that, um, so something first starts as, uh, so when you can't do something, it's uh, AI, but the moment you can do it, like, you don't really call it AI anymore, right? It's just mm -hmm. yeah, some technology you have and you don't take it as seriously as before. Right. And so the goalpost keeps moving, basically. Yeah. All right. That's a super interesting presentation and conversation. Uh, so thank you again, Telmo, for your, your talk. And thank you for everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, just a quick reminder that we have, uh, we will share this video uh, even after this live stream. We also have, we'll have the slides on GitHub. And uh, we ask you that you fill out a quick form uh, just a feedback form just to we can improve on further meetups you can also apply to be a speaker in what in one of our meetups and you have every link of this in the video description so thank you everyone again for watching and thank you tom for being our host today it's my pleasure thank you for having me thank you